Hello and welcome to worship at the Church of the Redeemer in Baltimore. I am Frida Marie Brown, a member of the clergy team here, and we're delighted that you're here with us to uh, to worship this third weekend um, of uh, Lent. So join with me now as we sing together hymn number 409. Jesus said, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. For the sin of silence, for the sin of indifference, 
for the secret complicity of the neutral, for the closing of borders, for the washing of hands, for the crime of indifference, and for the sin of silence, for all that was done, for all that was not done. Let there be no forgetfulness before the throne of glory. Let there be remembrance within the human heart. And let there at last be forgiveness when your children, all of your children, O God, are free and at peace. Almighty God, have mercy upon you. Forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen you in all goodness and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Lord, open our lips and our mouth shall proclaim your praise. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Psalm 19. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament shows his handiwork. One day tells its tale to another, and one night imparts knowledge to another. Although they have no words or language and their voices are not heard, their sound has gone out into all lands and their message to the ends of the world. In the deep has he set a pavilion for the sun. It comes forth like a bridegroom out of his chamber. It rejoices like a champion to run its course. It goes forth from the uttermost edge of the heavens and runs about to the end of it again. Nothing is hidden from its burning heat. The law of the Lord is perfect and revives the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure and gives wisdom to the innocent. The statutes of the Lord are just and rejoice the heart. The commandment of the Lord is clear and gives light to the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean and endures forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired than, than gold, more than much fine gold, sweeter far than honey than honey in the comb. By them also is your servant enlightened, and in keeping them there is great reward. Who can tell how often he offends? Cleanse me from my secret faults. Above all, keep your servant from presumptuous sins. Let them not get dominion over me. Then shall I be whole and sound and innocent of a great offense. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord my strength and my redeemer. Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and will be forever. Amen. A reading from the book of Exodus. Then God spoke all these words. I'm the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol, whether in the form of anything that is in heaven above or that is on the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or worship them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing children for the iniquity of parents to the third and the fourth generation of those who reject me, but showing steadfast love to the thousandth generation of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not make wrongful use of the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not acquit anyone who misuses his name. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. For six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath to the Lord your God. You shall not do any work, you, your son or your daughter, your male or your female slave, your livestock, or the alien resident in your towns. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, but rested the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and consecrated it. Honor your father and mother, 
so that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God has given you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or male or female slave or ox or donkey or anything that belongs to your neighbor. The word of the Lord. A reading from the Gospel of John. The Passover of the Jews was near, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple, he found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and the money changers seated at their tables. Making a whip of cords, he drove all of them out of the temple, both the sheep and the cattle. He also poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. He told those who were selling the doves, Take these things out of here. Stop making my father's house a marketplace. His disciples remembered that it was written, Zeal for your house will consume me. The Jews then said to him, What sign can you show us for doing this? Jesus answered them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said, This temple has been under construction for 46 years, and will you raise it up in three days? But he was speaking of the temple of his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. When was the first time you ever remember feeling angry? Perhaps an older or younger sibling was involved, a parent or babysitter, an uncooperative toy or a play date gone awry? What about a time when your anger boiled over to the point that someone observing you might have said your anger, your zeal was all consuming, that it engulfed you, that it practically ate you up, not to mention anyone or anything else close by? A few years ago, I had an unpleasant interaction that was wholly unexpected. I was picking up my daughter from a friend's house and had pulled over on the side of the road in front of the house waiting 
When a man pulled up alongside, rolled down his window, and started yelling at me to move my car, I sat behind my steering wheel, stunned and dumbfounded at his behavior, unable to get a word in to try to explain what I was doing. When I heard him shout in an accusatory and mocking tone, and you don't even speak English, something snapped inside of me. And before I knew it, I was out of my car, hands flailing in the air, hurling the finest English expletives that I could think of his way, along with a string of other words and impassioned sentences, something about how dare he assume, something about where I went to school, something about my lawyer, most of which I can't remember. It was not my best moment, nor I guess was it his. What I do remember is how utterly exhausted and spent I felt afterwards, exhausted, spent, and sad. I wonder how Jesus felt after the temple incident described in today's gospel, exhausted, exhilarated, spent, sad? And what about his friends and followers? Had they ever seen him that way before? Was it their first time witnessing his anger? Did it scare them, make them more tentative perhaps around him? Or had they experienced his anger before? And was this simply the only account we hear told of in the gospel narratives? of Jesus being this overtly outraged in public. We can only imagine. But what we do have is some clue as to why, why Jesus's anger was all consuming and engulfing, causing him to make such a scene overturning tables, driving out livestock and calling out the entire system of worship and ritual that was on full display at the temple. You see, it wasn't in fact worship and rituals that Jesus had a problem with. It was that this particular system of worship and ritual was backbreaking and unduly burdensome on God's people who were struggling the most to survive. It put enormous hoops and barriers up before the poorest the most vulnerable, controlling access, as it were, to God's mercy and forgiveness. In this ancient system, in order for you to be right with God, sacrifices on your behalf had to be offered within the temple by the priests, and in order for sacrifices to be offered, specific unblemished animals had to be purchased by you. And in order for unblemished animals to be purchased, money had to be exchanged. You couldn't use your usual Roman currency, which featured the graven image of Caesar, who claimed to be a god, on it. So you had to exchange your Roman currency for temple coins. As one biblical commentator describes, if you were wealthy, you gave a large animal like a cow or an ox, but if you were poor, you gave doves or pigeons. To purchase one pair of doves at the temple was the equivalent of two days wages. But the doves had to be inspected for quality control just inside the temple. And if your recently purchased unblemished animals were found to be in fact blemished, then you had to buy two more doves for even more days wages. Add to this the fact that if you were an out-of-towner, which most people were traveling from elsewhere for your yearly pilgrimage to Jerusalem for the Passover, the historian Josephus estimated up to two and a quarter million people visited the holy city for Passover each year, then you would also have to arrange and pay for lodging and food. All told, the commentator continues, 
A day's stay in Jerusalem during one of the three major festivals could cost between three to four thousand dollars in contemporary value, and you were required to at least uh, attend at least one of these three festivals each year. If you had that kind of money and wealth to be able to spare and spend, you were good to go. But most people, as today, did not. Hence, Jesus' anger, Jesus' outrage, Jesus' all-consuming passion, rage, and zeal. This, after all, is the same Jesus, the Jesus as portrayed through the lens of the fourth gospeler, John. The same Jesus who a couple of chapters later, we hear, encounters a Samaritan woman, the ultimate other, at a well, and engages her in conversation. And in response to her question, where is the correct place to worship God, here on my people's holy mountain or there on your people's holy mountain? Jesus responds, the hour is coming and is now here when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for the Father seeks such as these to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship God must worship in spirit and truth. God is spirit, and those who worship must worship in spirit and truth. This same Jesus, who speaks later on in the narrative of himself abiding in God's love, and his followers abiding in his love as branches of a vine. The ultimate question, it seems, that Jesus is getting at in this fourth gospel and pointing his followers then and now towards is where does God abide? Where is God's dwelling place? Where is God housed? In a physical building, made of stone, in a temple, in a house of worship, or in me, Jesus proclaims, and therefore in you, in the holy temple and tabernacle that is the human being made in the very image and likeness of God. And not just in some human beings, not just those with access to wealth and money, power and privilege, not just those of a certain rank or station in life, not just those with a certain ancestry or history, color or creed who worship on this mountain or that mountain, but every human being. Our human bodies, our own flesh and blood, these incredible structures of carbon atoms and molecules, recycled stardust and ocean water, are the very living temples of God's spirit God's consciousness, God's breath, God's heart, God's mercy, God's love. 20th century philosopher Martin Buber captures the essence of this truth when speaking of the I-thou way of being in the world. We can, as humans, choose to interact with others in a transactional way, treating others as objects, as i relating to it, or we can choose to interact with others in a relational way as I relating to thou in the same way we relate to the holy mystery that is God. As followers of Christ here and now in the 21st century, our commitment is to strive as best we can to relate to all human beings and to our own selves in an I-Thou way. In our baptismal covenant, we each promise to seek and serve Christ in all persons, loving our neighbors as ourselves, and to strive for justice and peace among all people, respecting the dignity of every human being. The season of Lent is a time when we are invited to recommit and be more intentional about this way of being, living, and relating in our world, 
taking care of our relationships with God, ourselves, and others, realizing that these relationships are all, in fact, interconnected and one, and realizing that we, in fact, do not need to be in a building made of stone to connect with the holy mystery that is God, because, in truth, we are relating and communing with God whenever we acknowledge God's living presence in our fellow human beings and in ourselves. Amen. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified on the Pontius Pilate, was suffered at death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures and ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son together, he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Let us pray. Eternal Spirit, Earth Maker, Pain Bearer, Life Giver, Source of all that is and that shall be, Father and Mother of us all, Loving God, in whom is heaven, the hallowing of your name echo through the universe, the way of your justice be followed by the peoples of the world. Your heavenly will be done by all created beings, your commonwealth of peace and freedom. Sustain our hope and come on earth. With the bread we need for today, feed us. And the hurts we absorb from one another, forgive us. In times of temptation and testing, strengthen us. From trial too great to endure, spare us. From the grip of all that is evil, free us. For you reign in the glory of the power that is love, now and forever. Amen. O God, whose glory is always to have mercy, be gracious to all who have gone astray from your ways and bring them again with penitent hearts and steadfast faith to embrace and hold fast the unchangeable truth of your word, Jesus Christ, your Son, who with you and the Holy Spirit lives and reigns, one God, forever and ever. Amen. The intercessions. We pray for the church and for our bishops. Lord, in your mercy. We pray for this parish family that we, like Abraham and Sarah, may go forth from what is familiar to new places and ways of being. Lord, in your mercy. We pray for the wisdom for the leaders of our nation at this time of turbulence and change, Lord, in your mercy. We pray for the sick and the suffering that we may bear God's healing touch, Lord, in your mercy. We pray for all who have died, for Trav Warfield, Joan McMahon, 
Jane Murray, George Wills, Herb Lauder, Nicholas Young, and Alice Benfer. Lord, in your mercy. God, who so loved the world that you gave your only Son, we lift up our eyes. Jesus, our hope, we lift up our voices. Spirit, our guide, we lift up our hearts. Receive our prayers for all in need and grant us a share in the life to come. Amen. Bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. Jesus invites us to a way of wholeness, sharing with the humble and poor. This is the fast we choose. Jesus beckons us to risk for the sake of the world. This is the fast we choose. Jesus challenges us to listen to those who feel they have no voice. This is the fast we choose. And the blessing of God Almighty, who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, be among you and remain with you always. Amen.